Adam Kerpel-Fronius und äh, ich möchte Sie im Namen der Stiftung Denkmal für die Ermordeten Juden Europa sehr herzlich begrüßen. Ich werde auch nicht lange reden, weil wir noch einen langen Abend vor uns haben. Und äh, ich möchte mich auch sehr herzlich bedanken, erstens bei Ihnen, die gekommen sind, aber auch sehr dem beim Leiter des Museums Herrn No Kohlenhof, äh, Bartholomew Kschanka, der zu uns gekommen ist und kurz ein Grußwort richten wird. Uh, I'm representing uh, the Helmno Memorial, which is a branch of the Martyrs Museum in Jabikovo. And uh, Cameron asked me for a short preface for his uh, presentation. Uh, in historiography, uh, the crimes against the disabled and patients of psychiatric hospitals committed in the Third Reich and later in the territories occupied by Nazi Germany are referred oftenly as the prelude to the Holocaust. In the centers of codenamed Tiergarten 4 Operation, technical experience and mental preparation were gained by functionaries of the security service and police formations, who later became part of the crews of the centers for the immediate extermination of Jews, including the Aktion Reinhardt camps. This was also the case with the camp in Helmno during the occupation Kulmhof, Created in the autumn of 1939 as part of the Einsatzgruppe 6 operating in occupied Wielkopolska, the SS Sonderkommando, under the command of Hauptsturmführer Herbert Lange, murdered patients of psychiatric hospitals in the Reich districts of Warteland, East Prussia, and probably in the occupied Netherlands from late autumn 1939 to summer 1941. About 10,000 people fell victim to the commando. In July 1941, the Reichstadthalter and Gauleiter of NSDAP, Arthur Greiser, decided on the final solution of the Jewish question in the Warteland. In the late summer of 1941, Herbert Lange came to Helmno and chose it as a center of operation. The extermination center he founded functioned in two periods from November 1941 to April 1943, then from March 1944 to January 1945. About 200,000 people were murdered there, mostly Jews from Poland, Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic and Luxembourg, about 4,300 Roma and Sinti, and smaller groups of victims, Poles, Czech children and Soviet prisoners of war. Almost 80 years have passed since the end of the World War II, and it would seem that we have already know quite well how concentration camps and extermination centers in occupied Europe functioned. However, our knowledge continued to expand. There are publications showing us new unknown documents and eyewitness accounts. It is no different in the case of the activities of the SS Sonderkommando Kulmhof. I will give you only one example. So far, we have only known five personal documents written down by Jewish forced laborers imprisoned in the camp. In 2018, an anonymous donor sent us a document, which after reading it, turned out to be a different version of the appeal to our future nation, known since 1945. Currently, this priceless testimony has been renovated and published, now it's in a collection of our museum. One of the key issues in the history of the Kulmhof death camp is the method of killing the victims, mobile gas chambers, which is similar to Lange and his commando, an element connecting the so-called euthanasia in Wartegau with the functioning of the camp. Many years of research by Cameron Munro and his team from the Tiergarten Fear Association, allow us to better understand of this aspect of the functioning of this first extermination camp. I hope there is so much material for writing a huge book about the mobile gas chambers because it's a lack of such publication. There are some articles, but no one gathered materials in one book. I would like to thank you once more for the invitation and encourage you to listen to the lecture. Thank you. This is the second of three lectures on the Nazis' use of poison gas 
uh, in the Holocaust and in other killing programs they undertook. The first lecture last October was on the unknown origins of Nazi mass killing methods and ideas. Uh, my conclusion is the Nazis invented nothing, by the way, and again, that theme will come out during the lecture. The section, second lecture is on the Nazis' use of gas vans in the Holocaust and in other killing programs they undertook. Why the gas vans? There is no book on the gas vans. Sorry, there are two books, both by deniers. But there is no historical book on the Nazis' use of the gas vans. Uh, it gets worse because the internet and the history books are littered with errors in relation to how the gas vans were developed and what they were used for. Uh, I put up one example here, not to uh, pick on any, any individual, but this is a, taken from a, uh, actually a very good website on the uh, killing of the Jews in the Semlin Juden Lager in Belgrade. And underneath you can see the, it is described as a Zaura gas van, similar to that used in the execution of Jews from Semlin. This is not, you can patently see, the logo on the van is a Magyarus Deutz. It is not a Zaura. In addition, this photograph is well known. Bartek would know it well. This comes from the Polish investigation of Helmno undertaken by Bednash in May 1945. This van was dis discovered in the Ostrovsky factory in Kolo, which is about 12 kilometers from Helmno. And one witness says he saw this van driving in the air of Helmno and took it to be a gas van. It is almost certainly not a gas van. There were many uh, trucks, including a Magyarus Deutz, because we have in our, our collection a photograph of the driver from Helmno and the Magyarus Deutz that was used for transporting Jews. So to start off with, there is no known photograph of a gas van used by the Nazis in any time between 1939 and 1945. The problem with trying to use photographs of supposed gas vans is it gives sucker to deniers. So the gas vans have actually become, and I suspect that's the reason there is no historical book on the gas vans, they have become the cause celebre for deniers. And that's why we have two books by deniers on the gas vans and no book by a historian. To do a, uh, revise a bit of, about what I talked about in my first lecture, the Nazis did not invent gas vans. They did not invest, invent gas vans for killing. Actually, this can be traced back to the 1850s, to the country of my birth, uh, Britain. Uh, a medical doctor called Sir Dr. Benjamin Ward Richardson had been investigating since the early 1850s more humane methods of killing animals and he had been experimenting with small-scale gas chambers and different types of gas to basically more humanely, the word being humane, more humanely kill animals, including stray cats and dogs. In 1884, he gave a lecture at the Royal Society of Arts in London called uh, On the Painless Extinction of Life in Lower Animals, in which he describes in great detail a large-scale gas chamber he was asked to build for the Battersea Dogs Home in London. That gas chamber was designed to kill 200 stray cats and dogs at a time, highly engineered, based on Dr. Richardson's 30 years of experimentation and knowledge. Dr. Richardson, having built that gas chamber, then came to the conclusion, you will not always be able to bring the victims to the kill, killing mechanism, in this case the gas chamber, sometimes you have to take the mechani mechanism to the victims. So he comes up with the idea of effectively a gas van. And he describes it in great detail in his lecture, but the two points, key points, that come out of his lecture in relation to his gas van 
it is a small-scale apparatus. It is not meant for mass killing. Secondly, it needs to be moved easily from place to place. Those are the two key points. These are actually pictures of his gas, uh, gas van that he designed. Obviously, it was not uh, motorized. It was a hand-pushed uh, gas van. The principles of building any gas chamber or gas van are very much the same. There's four factors to be taken into account. First of all, you need to gas-proof the space in which the victims will be killed. Secondly, you need to decide uh, on which gas you will use to do it. Thirdly, you need to uh, build a mechanism that will allow that gas to be uh, taken into the space in which you're going to kill the victims. Fourthly, what are the objectives you have in mind? Do you want to kill quickly? Do you want to kill humanely? Do you want to do a combination of both? And lastly, you need to do it safely for those who are applying the methodology. As always, uh, once a, a new technology is developed, it gets developed even further. Uh, the Americans are always very good at taking British ideas and making them marketable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No difference in the case of using gas chambers and poison gas to kill stray cats and dogs. These are two photographs from American newspapers from the 30s that show you how far the Americans actually had developed the technology. On the left-hand side, this is a gas trailer developed by a police, one police department in a state in America. And they decide the previous uh, generation of carbon monoxide to kill uh, stray cats and dogs from charcoal was too messy, too difficult. Why not make it easy? Let's just connect the exhaust of an automobile to the gas trailer and we can kill uh, the, the methodology to the animals that we capture and kill them either on the move or when uh, taking them to another place. The second uh, photograph also from an American newspaper shows an adaptation of that, adaptation of that. Why not build a gas chamber in the garage of the dog pound and then you can connect any vehicle that happens to be there to the dog pound and pump in exhaust gas into the gas chamber to kill the stray cats and dogs. From the 1880s, uh, in the globalized world in which uh, existed at that time, the movement of people and ships, etc., meant there was uh, a significant worry about the transportation of, for example, the plague, which still existed in, the, in, the, in that period. They start to disinfest ships of, uh, of rats using sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen cyanide, all asphyxiating gases. This process is then adapted, and this is a photograph from the Plant Protection Office, and they have built themselves a gas van to dis, uh, disinfest plants in the rear of the gas van. They apply the gas, uh, and that's the process. Another adaptation of this, which comes out of the Industrial Revolution and the growth of sprawling cities where disease is rife. And this is a, actually a picture from, the, uh, from England in a, in a German book from 1942. This shows a gas trailer developed by a local council in England. And the idea was to disinfest the houses of the slums in the city in the UK, the house would be emptied of all belongings, and the house itself would be disinfected, for example, with hydrogen cyanide. Actually, in the end, they started using Zyklon B. And all of the belongings would be put in this gas-proof trailer, where the same process would be applied to the belongings of, the, uh, of those from the house that was also be, being disinfected 
fested. And this picture shows uh, actually use of uh, prussic acid, prussic acid, hydrogen cyanide, Zyklon B. The 1930s is uh, what we term the decade of gas. The First World War had seen the mass, first mass use of poison gas on the battlefield. By the 1930s, everybody is paranoid that the next war, which everybody could foresee coming, will be a war of chemical weapons. So all countries in Europe, America, and other countries around the world uh, build up a civil defense infrastructure that includes issuing gas masks to the complete civil population. Uh, if you're going to issue people gas masks, they have to know how to use them, or otherwise they are worthless. So, for example, in the UK, but it also applied to other countries, the authorities start building fixed gas chambers in all the towns and cities where people can go and actually test the gas masks. And then the British realise, OK, what about remote areas where we can't, we can't just build thousands of fixed gas chambers? In late 35, they come up with the idea again, which is not new. In, instead of bringing the people to the mechanism, let's take the mechanism to the people. So they design and build 40 gas fans that are to be used for testing gas masks around the UK. And this picture, again, from an American newspaper, actually, from 1939, shows Scottish soldiers, as you can see, in kilts, going into the gas fan to test their gas masks. Obviously, they don't use hydrogen cyanide or carbon monoxide or some other deadly gas. They use tear gas or something similar to this. Again, this is a, a picture from a uh, Melbourne newspaper in Australia, The Age, which shows a gas trailer developed along the same lines as that developed by the British for testing gas masks. So in summary, I said it at the beginning, but I'll just say it again. The Nazis did not invent the idea of the gas fan or using the gas fan for killing. This idea had been around since the 19th century, it's not new. Usually we do our research from first principles, that means using the original records, be it war crimes, trials, testimonies, original documents. In this case, uh, we haven't done that, so we're reliant on work by done, done by other people. Before I started researching uh, the gas fans about 12 years ago, uh, I wouldn't have believed that the stories around the NKVD developing a gas fan in 37, 38 were realistic. Given my research, it's actually not very difficult and not very technical. Therefore, I am of the opinion it's quite possible that the uh, NKVD developed and used a gas fan at the Batovo firing range south of Moscow in 37, 38 for killing. Probably along the same principles as uh, we have previously seen and also the Nazis developed their gas vans. To properly understand the science, technology, and the thought process of the Nazis in terms of developing the gas vans, you need to have a underst basic understanding of the scientific principles of killing using carbon monoxide and exhaust gas. The principles of basic, very simple principles of respiration is you breathe in air, which includes oxygen through your lungs. The oxygen in your lungs attaches itself to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, which is then transported around the body, where the oxygen reacts with food in a process called metabolism to produce energy for the cells of the body to operate. The byproduct of that process is carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide attaches itself to the hemoglobin and is taken to the lungs where it's expelled. That whole process is called gas exchange. Carbon monoxide is between two and 300 times more affinitive to hemoglobin than oxygen. 
So relatively small amounts of carbon monoxide can displace the oxygen in the body and therefore lead to, in the end, if the concentration is high enough, death through carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, carbon monoxide po poisoning involves three stages. Stage one, which is where the uh, concentration of carbon monoxide attached to the hemoglobin is between zero and 30%. That's going to cause you to maybe feel faint, heart palpitations, breathlessness, etc. Stage two, between 30 and 45% attachment of the carbon monoxide to the hemoglobin. Things get a bit more serious. Uh, tendency to faint, defecation, nausea, vomiting, and other symptoms. And once the concentration is above 40%, tendency to unconsciousness, and when you get to uh, 65, 70%, death in most cases. Exhaust gas uh, also contains carbon monoxide. So the engines of the time from the 1930s, many automobiles, trucks, could generate exhaust gas with a concentration of carbon monoxide of up to 15%, which is actually uh, very uh, deadly. Uh, the Research on carbon monoxide up until 1939 was very significant, probably the most investigated gas. Why? Carbon monoxide was the biggest accidental killer in the, in the uh, industrialized Western world. That's because machinery, power stations, etc., etc., all produced carbon monoxide. So the research on it was significant uh, to such an extent a scientist, Veli, in 1934, actually came up with a formula in which you could calculate the time to reach each of the stages, three stages of carbon monoxide poisoning, based on knowing the size of the space, the number of people in the space, the rate of inflow of gas into the space, and the concentration of carbon monoxide in that gas. So that actually, the Nazis did not need to research anything with regard to the science of carbon monoxide poisoning. And actually this graph is, I call it a death graph, basically gives you all the information if you want to des uh, design a methodology for using carbon monoxide to kill. August 1939, Hitler gives the approval uh, for the beginning of the uh, adult mercy killing program in the Altreich. He gives the job to the KDF, Chancery de Führer, Philip Buhler, and to Dr. Karl Brandt. They give the day-to-day -day job to Victor Brack of the KDF. The KDF have no knowledge of killing. They are administrators, uh, bookkeepers, etc., etc., there are some discussions between the KDF and the psychiatric doctors as to how they'll implement the killing of the uh, adult uh, mentally and physically disabled. They finally decide on using gas in a number of centralized killing centers, including Grafenek, Brandenburg, and others. At the point they decide on that, they've still not decided on which gas to use. So they turned to Dr. August Becker. O Dr. August Becker, uh, a member of the SD, Amp 6. He's a chemist. He is transferred to the KDF to work for BRAC. He will become the, the roving killing inspector of the killing centers. At the same time, Arthur Neighbor, head of the Reich Criminal Police Amp, is pushing the Criminal Technische Institute, which is the forensic department of the KTI, because he always uh, wants to make himself look good in, in, in with Himmler and others. So Bidman is uh, assigned to advise and give a report on which is the best gas to use for the adult mercy killing program. 
In the meantime, Dr. August Becker has undertaken ex an experiment in Fort Seven near Poznan, or Poznan in German, in a casement for which there is a, a picture here. And they test, first of all, not carbon monoxide, they test Zyklon B, hydrogen cyanide. For obvious reasons, hydrogen cyanide, Zyklon B is rejected. And there are further discussions, and it is suggested to the Chancellor of the Führer they use carbon monoxide. So they undertake a second test with carbon monoxide in Fort 7 in the casement in the uh, first two weeks of October 1939. They under then undertake a, a, a number of other demonstrations and experiments, ex including one to Himmler, who visits Fort 7 in November, December 1939, and he is given a demonstration of the method. They then decide to adopt carbon monoxide as a gas that will be used for the adult mercy killing program in the Altrike. They will use pure carbon monoxide in uh, gas canisters. Herbert Langer, who has set up Fort Seven as a concentration camp in 1939 for Polish political prisoners, he hands over control of Fort Seven in uh, sometime towards the end of September, beginning of October 1939. And he is appointed to implement the adult mercy killing program in the Wartegau, so in uh, Western Poland. Fort Seven becomes a transit camp for Polish political prisoners, not the ideal place to build a gas chamber and kill lots of uh, the mentally and physically disabled. So somebody comes up with the idea, rather than having a centralized uh, killing center, let's bring the mechanism to the victims. We don't know who it is. It could have been Becker, it could have been Vidman, it could have been Langer, it could have been somebody else. What we do know is at the end of December 39, beginning of January 40, a, probably a gas trailer along the lines of one I showed earlier, was used for the first time on the patients from the Jakanka Asylum. Basically, and they were also using bottled carbon monoxide. So at this point, they are not using exhaust gas, they're using bottled carbon monoxide. And from December uh, 39, they use gas fans. They go through all the asylums in the Wartegau, this process, uh, continues into uh, 1940, 41. The gas fan itself goes through several development stages. At some point they decide having a trailer which has been towed around is not the ideal way to do it. So they end up using a converted furniture truck, uh, which is uh, the driving cabin and the gas proof space is integrated. By July 41, the, as Bartek mentioned in his introduction, thoughts are turning to the final solution. In September 41, Arthur Greiser gets approval from Hitler to kill 100,000 Jews of the Wartegal. Herbert Langer, who was responsible for the adult mercy killing program in the Wartegal, is given the job. They want to get started very quickly, so soon after the approval, uh, Langer begins killing the Jews of the Kornin region from the village ghettos. Uh, so there are two actions in end of September and into October 41. It is not known to what extent the gas vans, the gas van in this case, was used. Certainly they also used shooting, so it is not absolutely clear from the testimonies to what extent the gas van was used. The gas van is then used uh, end of October to kill the uh, occupants of the Jewish Old People's Home in Kalish. And then at the end of November, uh, the Langer commander goes to Kosmenek, Bornhagen in German, uh, which is a ghetto stroke labor camp. 
where they killed 600 uh, Jews. So that's the history of where the gas vans originated in the Third Reich. So, April, May 1941, preparations are beginning, or progressing, I should say, for Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. As part of those discussions and preparations, Arthur Neighbor, head of the Reich Criminal Police Amt, with his uh, baby, you might call it, the Criminal Technische Institute, which is, uh, he is always pushing its uh, abilities, goes to Heydrich and suggests to Heydrich, using the technology that had been previously used in the Vartigo, in the Soviet Union, for killing the uh, mentally and physically disabled of the Soviet Union. Heydrich approves that. He gives the job to Walter Rauf, who's head of AMP 2D in the Rack Security Main Office, which is responsible for automotive for both the Sicherheitspolizei and the SD. Neighbor is later heard to comment to Vidman, you can't expect soldiers to shoot idiots. The point here is, the gas funds were not developed for the final solution or for killing political prisoners. They were developed originally, the Reich Security Main Office gas funds, for killing the uh, mentally and physically disabled of the Soviet Union. One of the problems with uh, researching the gas vans is there are very few surviving original documents. I've put together here a timeline of the development of the Reich Security Main Office gas vans based on testimonies, the few documents we have, and other sources. I will go through these, but briefly, uh, neighbor goes to Heydrich in April, May 41. Late August 1941, a test gas van is produced, which is provided to the Criminal Technische Institute, who will provide the scientific and, and engineering uh, expertise on the build. Uh, October 19, uh, November 41, that gas van is taken to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, where there is an experiment done on Soviet POWs. November, December, the uh, first batch of gas vans are ordered and ready. Gas van drivers are assigned and ordered to Berlin. And in December 41, the first eight, uh, what I call Reich Security Main Office Series Wasgat 1 gas vans are dispatched from Prince Albrechtstrasse to uh, operations in the east. There is a second batch of gas vans produced in February, March 42, which are also dispatched east. So there were a total of 20 gas vans built and sent on operations by AMP 2D3A. August 1941, the gas vans are not ready for operations. A test gas van has uh, only just been delivered. Himmler visits Minsk on the 15th and 16th of August, 1941. He uh, is accompanied by uh, Eric von den Bach Salevsky, the higher SS police Führer for Russia Mitte. Also there probably is Arthur Neighbor, because Arthur Neighbor, as well as being the head of the Reich Criminal Police Amt, is head of Einsatzgruppe B, which is operating in the area around Minsk. Uh, an itinerary is set for Himmler. In Minsk, he visits the ghetto. He takes a tour of one of the Soviet POW camps. And thirdly, interestingly enough, he visits the Novinki Psychiatric Colony, which is a psychiatric colony just outside Minsk, 
And this is actually a photograph of Himmler visiting the colony on the 15th of August, 41. Uh, you can see here from, there's a doctor probably from the psychiatric colony and Dr. Otto Bradfish, head of Einsatz Commander 8, so Einsatz Group of B. In addition, Himmler witnesses a shooting by Einsatz Commando 8 in Minsk of Jews and other prisoners. It is probably Bekselevsky who has put Novinki on the agenda for Himmler, because up until this point, no order has been given to the Einsatzgruppe to clear the, the asylums of the mentally and physically disabled on a total basis. Some have been cleared, but mainly because of disease or the building was necessary, but no order has been given. So the asylums in uh, Bekselevsky's area, certainly around Minsk and Mogilev, are still intact. Bekselevsky probably takes Himmler there to get approval to kill the mental patients from the asylum. The gas fans aren't ready. So there are a number of discussions of what might be done in the absence of the gas fans. As I said earlier, Himmler had witnessed a test gassing in Fort 7 in November, December 1939. He knew Langer, Herbert Langer, who was responsible for the killings in the Bartograv, the mentally physically disabled, and the gas fan. Himmler suggests to Bekselevsky, why don't you send for Langer? He may be able to show you a method to do it. At the bottom is a decode. Actually, the British managed to de uh, decode the messages going back and forth on this. Whether or not Langer actually visited Bekselevsky is open to question. He probably did not, because by this time, the final solution is beginning in the Konin region of the Vatican. There was also a discussion between Arthur Neber, head of the Reich Criminal Police Amt, and Himmler, and probably Bekselevsky. Neber is always trying to push the capabilities of the Criminal Technische Institute to tell his bosses, Himmler, Heydrich, etc., how good he is. Neber says to Himmler, I've got two other ideas for killing, in addition to the gas vats. Himmler says to Neber, yes, undertake the experiments, write me, write me a report. Neighbor sends for Dr. Albert Widman, who is the toxicology expert at the Criminal Technische Institute, and he heads to Minsk in, at uh, the first or second week of September, 1941. Neighbor and Widman undertake, undertake three experiments. The first experiment is on patients from the Minsk Second Municipal Hospital. They are taken to a forest outside Minsk where there is an earth bunker with a wooden roof. Neighbor has the idea. He was actually a, uh, during the First World War, he, had, uh, he was a pioneer and therefore had knowledge of how to use explosives, etc. He had an idea to use explosives to kill mental patients. Now, the idea was not, as is probably written in the history books, to blow people up. That made no sense. Actually, the idea was to use specific types of explosives which have very high concentrations of carbon monoxide in the gas cloud, once exploded, to produce a gas cloud from the explosion that would kill the victims almost immediately. That was the experiment. It didn't work. The, the first time around, the roof blew off and all the carbon monoxide ex escaped, so the patient survived. Second time, they gave up. They just collapsed the bunker on the, uh, on the unfortunate patients from the hospital. The second experiment took place at the Novinki Psychiatric Colony, which Himmler had visited. In this case, uh, which was... Uh, a more, probably a more sensible idea in terms of uh, the Nazis was to uh, seek out a gas-proof room, in this case the bathhouse of the colony, which is ideal as a gas-proof room, and connect up trucks via a, a schlauch, a hose between the truck and the room, and gas the patients there. This comes back to the idea, I showed two pictures from America, 
that was the idea the, the one police department in America had adopted. The uh, neighbor had the idea to adopt it as another killing method. The first experiment done in Novinki wasn't wholly successful. Some of the patients didn't die and had to be shot. There was a third experiment which used exactly the same technique as used in Novinki, this time in Mogilev. And probably this time, Bexolevsky was present to see how the methodology worked because he had an interest in uh, possibly developing Mogilev as a potentially a death camp and was, wanted to understand the methodology. Again, same methodology applied, but this time they took more precautions. They bricked up the window of the room to be used as a gas chamber and they bricked into the room two metal pipes that could then be connected via a, a Panzerschlauch, a hose to the exhaust of the vehicles to be used. The picture below probably, most likely actually shows a film of the test in Mogilev, probably taken by Arthur Neighbor, who was a fanatic photographer and, and filmer. While he was head of Einstein's Group of B, he used to head round the local region uh, photographing and taking films of the local population. Again, probably, it's not absolutely clear from the testimonies, in the second, uh, third test of the second methodology, they killed approximately 800 patients from the asylum using this method in one day, probably, which actually shows it as a potentially a method they, they could have used. Okay. Finally, in August 1941, a test gas van is ready. In terms of who was given the responsibility for building it and uh, giving the, uh, the scientific and technological advice, Ralph gives the job to the head of AMP 2D3A, which is uh, automotive for the Sikkerheits Polizei, Friedrich Predel. He, in turn, gives the practical day-to-day -day job to Harry Weintritt, who's head of the repair workshop at the Reich Security Main Office, AMP 2D3A. Again, and Vidman keeps popping up all over the place, Vidman and the KTI are to provide scientific and technical advice on building the gas fans. I mentioned earlier there were 20 what I call Reich Security Main Office gas vans built. Eight of those were the smaller uh, chassis design, of which there were eight. The bigger one, there were 12 built. The killing capacity of the smaller van was 75 persons maximum. Uh, on the bigger one, it was 108 persons. What is interesting about this, we, ha we have no surviving documents on this, but it's very clear from the testimonies. AMP 2D3A cannot source chassis to build the gas vans. Barbarossa is in full swing. There's a lack of trucks. There's a lot of automotive vehicles. They cannot get chassis to build the gas vans, which shows this is not a top priority at this time. On the smaller uh, gas van, they have to source a, uh, a range of different chassis, basically what they can get their hands on. They manage to get, so there's an Opel Diamond, Opel Blitz, Renault, Chrysler Dodge, Vauxhall Bedford. The Vauxhall Bedford's probably a British truck captured on the British retreat to Dunkirk. And Magiris Deutz possibly as well. So they have to take whatever they can get and they get these chassis in this case, for the smaller one from AMP 2D3B, which is automotive for the SD. They're scrounging around trying to get the material to build the gas vans. Uh, in the case of the bigger van, the Zara, they managed to get 12 chassis from the Kraftfahrwesen in the Reichswehr Ministerium. I've classified these, the smaller van as a Series 1 van, the bigger one as a Series 2. Now, actually, my opinion is based on the research, it was nothing to do about designing a smaller one or a bigger one. They just took what chassis they could get 
and actually built the gas fan or the cast and outbow for the gas fan onto the chassis they've got. So while I refer in the lecture and uh, other research to series one and series two, they are probably not series one and series two. They are just whatever was made available, they built uh, a cast and aft bow on, on the back of it. I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture in terms of Dr. Richardson, there's four to five points to think about in terms of building a gas fan. One, you need a gas-proof space in which to kill the victims. Two, you need to decide on the gas. Three, you need a mechanism how to introduce the gas into the gas-proof space. Four, you need to decide, decide the objectives. Is it to kill quickly? Is it to kill humanely? Or both? And you also need to do it safely for the operators of the mechanism. AMP2D3A approaches a company called Gaubschat in Berlin, who had been founded in 1904 by Fritz Gaubschat. They build chassis for buses and other types of vehicles. During the war, they work exclusively for the Wehrmacht, producing non-standard vehicles, cast and aufbau. A cast and aufbau is a box body, basically, for example, what you see on the back of this bus, that's called a cast and aufbau in German. Box body sounds a bit clumsy in English, so I always use the German in this case. And Gaubscher are asked to build the cast and outbows for the gas vans. They're not told they will be used as gas vans. There's no need to tell them. Gaubscher will build the cast and outbows as they would for any other vehicle order from the Wehrmacht. Uh, Gaubschad are told actually the, the vans will be used as mobile mortuaries for transporting the dead of people, uh, dead bodies of those who had died from communicable diseases like typhus. Gaubschad's uh, workshops are in Neuer Köln. This is a photograph from the 1950s. And I've got three examples here of cast and outbow. Again, there is no known photograph of a gas van. So I have three examples here of what the cast and outbows look like. This is a photograph of a first aid truck from Einsatz Commando A to Einsatz Gruppe B. You can see the cast and outbow, it's built of hard wood. The standardized cast and outbows produced by Gaubschat were all made of hardwood. Why? Metal is too heavy, so they use hardwood. Interestingly enough, the man standing at the rear in the uh, car, number four, that's Heinz Schlechter, who actually was a driver for Einsatz Commando 8 and subsequently drove a gas van that was assigned to Einsatz Commando 8. This is a second example. This is a mobile kitchen truck from Einsatz Commando 10A of Einsatz Group D. Again, you can see the hard hardboard superstructure of the cast and output. There's a third example, which is a radio command truck. Again, you can see the hardboard structure of the cast and output. So, Gaubschat with task were building the cast and output. This is the gas-proof space. What did they do? They built the standard cast and output structure. They then lined the, the interior with probably zinc galvanized iron. Why? To make it gas-proof. They then added on the, uh, on the back metal doors sealed with rubber such that the space would be gas-proof. This is actually a drawing of the gas van produced by Wilhelm Krieger, head of the construction office of Gaubschat, for a post-war testimony. The final thing Gaubschat were asked to do was to uh, build uh, wooden grates for the floor of the gas van. It's a drawing by Gustav Labs, uh, who was a gas van driver in Kumhof. So, Gaubschat have done the first stage in terms of building the gas van, that is building the gas-proof cast and outback. It is decided, obviously, that exhaust gas 
will be the killing gas. So the next stages are you need to design a mechanism for how the exhaust gas will be uh, taken into the gas-proof space, the gas and outbow. The gas van are delivered to, Ampt, uh, to Reich Security Main Office headquarters, Prince Albert Strasse, now Niederkirchnerstrasse, and Wilhelmstrasse. These whole series of buildings are uh, buildings of the Reichsführer SS, Chief of Polizei and Chief of the SIPO and SD, and the Reich Security Main Office offices. Amp 2D3A have a small garage and workshop round about there. Each gas van is brought there to have a mechanism fitted to allow the gas, exhaust gas to flow from the engine of the vehicle into the cast and output. This is a 1932 photograph. This possibly is the entrance to the rear of the Rack Security main office buildings. So, Harry Weintritt from AMP 2D3A is given the job by Pradel in terms of designing a mechanism for how the exhaust gas might be led into the cast and outbound. So he designs a mechanism using a schlauch, Panzer schlauch as it's known, which is just a flexible metal hose developed in the 1920s to allow mechanics to work on vehicles in garages. The flexible metal hose would, would be connected to the exhaust pipe and led outside the garage. So obviously all the exhaust fumes are not building up in the garage and causing a problem for the mechanics. Based on the testimonies, it's not absolutely clear, but it does seem there were two different mechanisms. Whether one was developed at the beginning and then changed is not clear from the testimony. But we do know the first design was uh, a hole was cut in the uh, bottom of the cast and outbow. A, a pipe was soldered on into a hole cut in the exhaust pipe underneath. And the connection between those two, when the gas van was to operate as a gas van, was the Panzerschlag, the flexible metal hose. The idea being, in this case, you would need a diverter tap to flow the uh, exhaust gas into the cast and outbow, or have it act as a normal truck uh, by allowing the exhaust gas to just go through the exhaust pipe. The second design was a bit simpler. It does seem that uh, there were some problems with that mechanism, and they moved to another mechanism, which was just to cut off the exhaust pipe halfway down, and then, very simple process, you could, the schlauch is connected to the hole into the cast and outbow. You put the other end of the schlauch onto the end of the exhaust pipe. And when you want it to operate as a normal truck, you just take it off. Uh, the problem with that is the reason exhaust pipes extend out to the ex end, uh, end of trucks and uh, cars, in the 1920s they discovered a lot of people were being killed while driving because the exhaust gas was feeding back into the driver's cabin. So I still haven't got to the bottom of uh, when they decided to do this and why. It's probably because the first mechanism was too complicated and they always had problems with the schlag. The other job AMP 2D3A had to do at the workshop at uh, Rag Security Main Office, they fitted a pipe system on the floor of the cast and outbow. On top of that would lay the wooden grates. In the smaller Series 1 gas fan, the pipe system was U-shaped, and there were a series of holes, five millimeters wide, cut. The reason for that being, uh, if you just had one input source for the gas into the van, then all the people were trying to rush away from the source. And also you would get a problem that possibly some of the victims would not die because the gas was not evenly spread around the cast and outbow. This is the reason they put in a pipe system. In the series two, the bigger one, they have an H-shaped system. So 
In terms of the processes, we now have the cast and outbow, we now have the gas, exhaust gas, we now have the mechanism such that the gas can be led into the cast and outbow. The next process is to design a methodology for how to use the gas vents. That is why a test gas van, an Opel Blitz Series 1, is delivered to the Criminal Technische Institute in Wright Criminal Police Amt's headquarters in Werdischermarkt. And in the courtyard of the RKPA, they undertake experiments. What are they doing? First of all, they do something very basic. They're measuring what is the carbon monoxide content of the exhaust. Secondly, they're looking at what adjustments they can make to the truck to increase the concentration of carbon monoxide in the exhaust gas. They undertake for a month, six weeks, two months, tests. Finally, they come up with some sort of methodology. And as with all new products, you have to test it. In this case, they take the Opel Blitz to Sachsenhausen, where they test the procedure and the gas van on Soviet POWs. There are at least two tests, probably three. The first test fails. We don't know why, but it fails. Finally, sometime probably towards the end of November, they decide on a methodology for using the gas van. What are the objectives? Comes back to what I said in terms of Dr. Richardson. Is the aim to kill quickly? Is the aim to kill humanely? And obviously you have to design a methodology that's safe for the appliers of the process. And they come up with this standard methodology, which is, which is almost always used by the gas van drivers who are assigned to drive the Reich Security Main Office gas vans. The, dry, the methodology is that the gas vans will be used when the van is stationary. Not driving, stationary. Why is that? Very simple. Scientific research before the war had shown the highest concentration of carbon monoxide in exhaust fumes is generated when a vehicle is stationary. Not when it's accelerating or decelerating or climbing up a hill, when it's stationary. So the idea is here, the van operates when stationary, you pull the choke half out, you get the revs up to 1200 cc's, and you get the highest concentration of carbon monoxide in the exhaust. The reason being, and Vidman laid this out pretty clearly after the war in his uh, police interrogations, the idea is to get the concentration of carbon monoxide up to 1% as quickly as possible. Interestingly enough, while avoiding the first two stages of carbon monoxide poisoning, the first two stages of carbon monoxide poisoning are the symptoms the victims suffered. Now, I can't believe this was done for the victims. This can only have been done for the perpetrators so they didn't have to see some of the effects of the carbon monoxide on the victims. So the idea was the gas van would be st run stationary for eight to 10 minutes to ensure the victims are at least unconscious, if not dead. Second stage, there was, you rev the engine for one or two minutes to get the uh, volume of carbon monoxide up, again, to make sure the victims are unconscious or dead. The third stage, the schlauch on the gas van will be disconnected and the vehicle will operate as a normal van. The van is then driven to the place where the victims will be buried or cremated or whatever is to be done with them. So the victims are actually subject to the carbon monoxide in the cast and out by for another 10 or 20 or 30 minutes, however, however long the drive is. So that process is aimed to last a minimum of 20 minutes. In most cases, it was longer. AMP 2D3A, which uh, developed and built the gas van, were also responsible for the drivers of the Sikkerheitspolizei. They sought out and assigned drivers to drive the Reich Security Main Office gas vans. These are two examples, Labs and Gable. Labs had been a member of the SS and, uh, since 1932 and the Nazi party. He'd been a driver for the SD since 1938. Gable, who was from Czechoslovakia, had joined the 
Nazi party and was a member of the SD from 1940. So these were old and trusted drivers. When the gas vans are ready for dispatch, the drivers are ordered, ordered to report to Amp 2D3A in Prince Albertstrasse, where they are given a short training course on the methodology, what are the dangers of using the gas vans, because all of these technologies have some dangers. You really don't want to be smoking too close to, for example, a van full of exhaust gas, et cetera, et cetera. So they're given a short training course, they're shown the procedure. Then they drive out of Prince Albert Strasse, along Wilhelmstrasse East with the gas vans to operations. They are usually assigned a co-driver in Berlin who was just there to make sure uh, if any assistance is needed, there's somebody there. In most cases, it was the uh, gas, the Reich Security Main Office gas van drivers who were assigned with their van to their unit. Usually the co-drivers were not, they were just there for the trip east. So in terms of where the gas vans were assigned, the Series 1 gas vans, of which there were eight, they were assigned in December 41. Zonder Commander Kulmhoff got two. The uh, Commander de Sikkerheitspolizei, formerly Einsatzgruppe A, got one. KDS Minsk, formerly Einsatzgruppe A, got one. Smolensk, where uh, headquarters of Einsatzgruppe B, they got one. Einsatzgruppe C, headquarters in Kiev, got one. Einsatzgruppe D, headquartered in Simferopol, they got two. That was the eight assignments of the December, in December 1941 of the Series 1 gas vans. February, March 42, the Zara, the series, series 2 are ready. They are as assigned as follows. Mauthausen Concentration Camp gets one. The SIPO SD in Belgrade, who will kill the, the, the Jews of the Semlin Judenlager, are given one. The Commander de Sikkerheitspolizei in Lublin is given one. KDS Riga gets one. Einsatzgruppe B gets two. Einsatzgruppe C gets three. Einsatzgruppe D gets two. <coughs> so at this point, the Einsatzgruppe have 14 gas vans. Kolmov have two. Lublin has one. Belgrade has one. Mauthausen has one. Just for completeness, I put this up, but I pretty much already described it. This shows uh, the allocation of the Series 1 gas van, uh, actually, and what the chassis manufacturer and type were. This shows the allocation of the Series 2 gas van. The, sip, uh, the van assigned to Belgrade to kill the Jews of the Semlin Judenlager is only needed from March 42 to May 42. It's then sent back to Berlin where it's refurbished and assigned to Einsatzgruppe A, yeah, KDS Riga. Staffel Posen, the Zonder Commander in Kulmov, also gets a Series 2 for a very short time in July 42. It seems from the testimonies it didn't work properly to the satisfaction of the Commandant, so they sent it back. In any case, it is, uh, uh, it's not absolutely clear, but it's possible this gas van was assigned to Einsatzgruppe B, uh, Einsatzkommando 7A. And at that point, the Einsatzgruppe would have had 16 gas vans, four for each Einsatzgruppe. Okay. I mentioned Dr. August Becker at the beginning in relation to the adult mercy killing program. He was assigned as the roving killing in inspector of the Nazi adult mercy killing program in the Altreich, and he was responsible for delivering the gas canisters to the institutions and checking if there were any problems. When the formal adult mercy killing program is brought to an end in August 1941, he is reassigned, and he is reassigned to the gas vans. He reports then to Walter Rauf, head of AMP 2D, and his job is to go with the gas vans to the Einsatzgruppe to check how they're being used, whether they're being used properly, whether there's any suggestions on improvements, 
etc., etc. Okay. I want to go through now uh, briefly how the gas vans were used at individual units. Kolmhoff starts operation on the 8th of December 1941. Prior to this date, the gas van has been used in the Vartigo for the final solution in Kornin, in Kalish, and in uh, Bornhagen. And the gas van has been used then on the basis of bringing the killing methodology to the victims. That's fine if you don't have so many victims. But what to do about the Lodz ghetto, Litmanstadt ghetto, the, biggest, the big ghettos of the Vartika? It makes no sense in terms of efficiency to bring the gas van to them. It's easier to bring the victims to the killing methodology. So, as Bartek uh, pointed out, Langer signs a lease on the old mansion house in Helmno village. Uh, and that is to be the base of operations for the Zonderkommando. And they also lease a space in the, in the forest, uh, which the mansion become, becomes known as the Schlosslager, the forest space becomes known as the Waldlager. The idea is the victims will be brought to the Schloss where, where they will undress, they will then go into the gas van, be gassed, driven to the Waldlager, and the, uh, the bodies either buried initially and subsequently cremated. It is interesting what Herbert, and Herbert Langer obviously continued in his role, at least until April, May 42, when he was replaced by Bodman. But Langer uh, uh, developed what I call just-in-time killing. So just in time referring to 1970s Japanese car production where you don't want big warehouses full of uh, parts for cars, etc. You just bring the parts as you need them. And Langer develops this method in Kolmhoff. So he is not doing it most efficiently. It's not efficient to be using gas vans in Kolmhoff. What they should have used, and which was used in other camps, was fixed gas chambers. But Langer is, maybe he is, it's his idea, he's the developer, he wants to use gas vans. So what they have to do is actually develop the most efficient process using the gas vans. From January 42, the Zonderkommando Langer is tasked with killing between 800 and 1,000 mainly Jews per day. He has assigned two gas vans from the Reich Security Main Office, each with a capacity of 75. I have calculated it took 67 minutes to load the gas vans, gas the victims, drive to the Waldlager, unload the bodies, and drive back to start again. So basically in an hour, with two gas vans, it was possible only to kill about 130, and that was with no problems, holdups. So Langer and subsequently Boltman set about developing a just-in-time process. Who's going to slow up the process? People who can't walk, the ill, the sick. They are not put in the gas van, they're shot, because they will slow the process. In addition, in Komov, they begin uh, the process by gassing the victims at the Waldlager. So they took the victims from the Schloss while they were still alive in the back of the gas van, drove the six kilometers to the Waldlager and gassed them there. But guess what? you still got the 20 to 30 minutes to wait in the Waldlager before the victims are dead. Why not do the gassing in the Schloss and use the time while you're driving to the Waldlager to, uh, to kill the victims? So, in addition, they bring the victims the night before. So they have the victims ready there first thing in the morning, then bring them on trucks to the Schlosslager. They go through the undressing process, killed, etc. So this is a just-in-time killing process, but using a methodology that is not the most efficient. It would actually be more efficient for the Nazis to use fixed gas chamber in Tacoma. This is a drawing by one of the members of the Sonder Commando. It just shows the village in Kumhof. It was a live village. Volksdeutsch live here. Poles live here. Within a few meters of actually the, the death camp. 
This is a drawing by Gustav Labs, Labs gas van driver at uh, Kulmhof, and shows the process in the Waldlager for unloading the bodies. Now, he's drawn this in relation to a crematorium. The crematoria, field crematoria, were only introduced into Kulmhof from June, July, 42. Before that, the bodies were buried. What this drawing shows is, number one, the gas van approaches the crematorium. They open the doors, or the Jewish Arbeiter Commander opened the doors, and the ex uh, all the exhaust gas that is built up in the Kassenaufbau is let out. Some of the bodies have uh, piled up against the doors. Those bodies fall out. They need to be removed by the Jewish Arbeiter Commando. Labs then reverses the van to, the, uh, to near the field crematoria. The rest of the bodies are dumped out. Once they're dumped out, the, the van is driven 20 meters away, number three, where it is given an interim clean, the worst of the mess in the rear of the gas van, and then immediately drives back to the Schlosslager to repeat the process. The largest number of vans were assigned to the Einsatzgruppe in the Soviet Union. The Einsatzgruppe commanders were told when the gas vans were delivered, stop shooting, use gas, use the gas van. This was never feasible given the size of the Soviet Union and how spread out the Einsatz commandos were, how spread out the victims were, quality of the roads, etc., etc. The gas vans in the Soviet Union were used on a very piecemeal basis. The Einsatz group and Einsatz commanders continued to use shooting. Sometimes they used the gas van. Actually, where the gas van was used most often was it was attached to the local staff or prison etc., etc., and it was used to get, uh, gas uh, prisoners that were collected in the prison, whether it be Jews or political prisoners or uh, partisans. But in very few cases were they used for what I would call mass killing. In fact, I can only, so far, based on my research, I can only come up with three examples. In the summer of '42 in Smolensk, three gas vans from Einsatz Group B were used to kill the 3,000 Jews of the Smolensk ghetto. Again, in the summer of 42, a trainload of Jews from the Altreich was on its way to Minsk, to Mali Trotsonets. The train was, in this case, was unloaded in Baranovica, and there were two gas vans used to kill the victims. And the third case was there were approximately 12 transports of Jews from the Altreich to uh, Minsk, Mali Trotsonets, in the summer of 42. On at least one of those occasions, the gas, a number of gas vans were gathered, between four and five, actually, and they were used to murder the, the Jews who were on their way to Minsk, uh, Mali, Trotsonets. But in general, the gas vans in the, were not used by the Einsatzgruppe on a mass basis. If you wanted to do mass killing, you needed to gather a number of vas, gas vans together. It was just not efficient to have a single van. You could use it on a daily or a weekly basis to kill people from collected in prisons, but in terms of killing uh, you know, mass numbers of Jews from the ghettos, etc., it was not a feasible option. And I just put this uh, slide up out of interest, given the times we live in. This shows some of the uh, gas van operations of uh, Einsatzgruppe C and D. Einsatzgruppe C, headquartered in Kiev, D in Simferopol. As I mentioned earlier, the command, uh, commander of the Sikkerheitspolizei in Lublin got a gas van. The, uh, there was a Stapos uh, prison in uh, Zamek Castle. They were given a, a Series 2 gas van, which they used for on a weekly or whenever uh, the, the numbers in the prison built up for gassing the inmates of the prison. Those subject to the Gestapo standing court, for example, in Zamek Castle. The process was they would be gassed at the castle and then driven to Majdanek concentration camp where the bodies would be unloaded and cremated. There's also some evidence 
the gas van operated in Samosk. Possibly other areas of the government general. I've already mentioned this a couple of times. Uh, the SIPO in Belgrade got a gas van basically to kill the 5,000 inmates of the uh, Semlin Samjista Judenlager on the outskirts of Belgrade. That didn't last long. It was over by mid May, and then the gas van was sent back to Berlin. Also, interestingly, Mauthausen got a gas van, which, uh, based on the research, shuttled back and forth between Mauthausen and its sub camp Gusen, a few uh, kilometers along the road. Okay. Just for completeness, I don't really have time to talk about that, about this uh, to any large extent. There were, you can divide the gas vans into what I call the Reich Security Main Office gas vans. Those are the 20 gas vans I've described, eight allocated in December uh, 41, 12 in February, March 42. But there were other gas vans used. We've already talked about Staffel Posen in the Wartegau, beginning with the adult mercy killing program in the Wartegau. That gas van was probably also used in the, uh, in the killing of the reg uh, Jews from the Kornin regional ghettos. It was certainly used for the, in Kalish and in Kosmenek, Bornhagen. Uh, it's open to question whether, because the gas vans assigned to Kulmhoff, the two Reich Security Main Office ones didn't arrive till just before Christmas 41. Kulmhoff starts operation on the 8th of December. It's an open question to what extent that gas van was used or whether they resorted to shooting before the two gas vans arrived. Uh, there is some evidence that Mauthausen built their own gas van, much as Langer had done from a converted lorry. Uh, in Belzec, before the official opening of Belzec, they also built their own gas van, again from a converted truck. And that operated from spring of 42 until at least November 42, used for uh, killing mentally and physically disabled, maybe others. And interestingly enough, uh, Field Gendarmerie Unit 570, based in Mogilev, they built their own gas van in the spring of 1944, very late on. Uh, they converted a Soviet truck that had been using as a kitchen wagon and basically uh, use it as a, as a gas van. I mean, they didn't use it for very long. Two other points here, so I don't forget. We have some evidence that parts of Einsatzgruppe D, which was disbanded in 43, were sent to government general with a gas van. And there is some evidence this gas van was assigned to Warsaw in the autumn of uh, 1943, post the destruction of the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw in May. But there were still stragglers in Nazi terms being discovered right into the autumn in uh, the Aryan side of Warsaw or from the ghetto. And uh, I have some testimonies that say that gas van was used there to kill women and children, Jewish women and children that were discovered. There's also a second case. I have some evidence that during the Warsaw Uprising of 1944, a gas van was present in Warsaw. Whether it was used or not is a different question, but they, I have some testimonies to support the fact there was a gas van in Warsaw in 44. Okay. This is a typical uh, public health poster you would see for carbon monoxide poisoning. Because carbon monoxide is still one of the biggest accidental killers in the Western world. So some of the things I talked about in terms of uh, stages one and stages two of carbon monoxide poisoning, this is typically what the warning signs would be. There does seem a movement these days that the individual feelings have become more important or paramount and outweigh everything else. 
that even seems to have spread to memorialization of the Holocaust and other Nazi war crimes. So I have spoken to two people recently who have told me they will no longer use graphic photographs, for example, from the liberation of the concentration camps in exhibitions for, for fear of upsetting people. I personally find that unbelievable. How can one properly memorialize the victims and remember the victims or understand the barbarity of the Nazis without understanding, for example, what the victims suffered? That seems not possible to me. So, and I make no apologies for this, the next three slides describe in graphic detail, based on witness testimonies, what the victims suffered in the gas vats. One point on that was interesting in the post-war testimonies. <coughs> Vidman, who was investigated for war crimes, specifically in relation to the gas vans, but also other war crimes, he told the investigators, but I don't think the investigators understood properly, that the aim of the methodology he developed for the gas vans was not only to kill quickly, but humanely. Quite patently, the methodology was not a method for killing humanely. We know from Kolmhoff, for example, that Ottomar Rosa, who gave one of the testimonies, who was a deputy to the commander of the Schutzpolizei in Lodz, Litmanstadt, was told by Herbert Lange, commandant, because uh, Rosa went to visit Kolmhoff, that the method was quick and humane. And he, Rosa asked Langer for a demonstration. And uh, Rosa said, this is neither quick or humane. This is not a pleasant way to die, psychologically or physiologically. This is the worst way to die. OK. Carbon monoxide, using carbon monoxide to kill is not foolproof for a number of reasons. One. Every individual has a different propensity as to how quick they will die from carbon monoxide poisoning. The old, the weak, the ill tend to die very quickly when the concentration of carbon monoxide in the hemoglobin is not that uh, significant. Others, for example, and there were, was research done on this, like small children, very strong or able men, can survive a long time. So, people survived the gas van process. In Komov, uh, on which I've done most research, by my calculations, on average, at least one person, on average, at least one person survived each gassing. So, 
we have many testimonies from Kumhof. Uh, the ones or the victims that were discovered to still be alive were shot. Now the question is, if you're unconscious and it's not noticed that you're still alive, you would have either been buried alive or even worse, when they introduced the crematorium in June, July 42, you would have been burned alive. Significant numbers of people survived the gas fire. I intimated this right at the beginning when I was talking about Dr. Richardson and the purposes of a gas fan. The gas fans were not designed for mass killing. They were designed for small scale killing where the gas fans would go to the victims. The gas fans got caught up in the extension of Nazi killing policies in the summer autumn of 41 and the Nazis tried to adapt them for use in the final solution. There was always problems, the same problems with the gas fans. Brakes, because you load a lot of people onto a truck which is heavy anyway, you're going to get brake problems. There was problems with the schlauch. There were problems in the Soviet Union because of the weather. The winter of 41-42 was one of the worst on record. The roads were impassable, the gas fans couldn't operate. The Series 2 gas fan was too heavy for the Soviet Union, so they had to reduce the capacity. Even then, in many cases, they couldn't operate. It was so cold, they couldn't use trucks in, in some of the months of the winter of 41, 42. They resorted to building bonfires under the vans. Also, if the gas van wasn't operated properly, and we got the case from Kulmhof, where uh, there was an explosion uh, in the schloss of a gas fan, probably because too much buildup of uh, gas in the Kassenaufbau, which produced an explosion. Friedrich Predel, head of AMP 2D3A, who designed and built the gas fans, in a post-war testimony, said, Ralph once snapped at me. We'd built shit. These things didn't work. I... Prado replied to Ralph that I told him beforehand these vehicles were not suitable for Russia. So I've been working on this for a long time, an estimate of the number of victims of the RAG security main office gas funds. The Komov one I am very comfortable with. I've done a detailed re reconciliation by ghetto of the number of victims uh, of the ghettos and others killed in Kulmov. By my estimates, because uh, Kulmov operated in two periods, in the first period, which was December 41 to April 43, uh, by my estimates, 149,526 are killed in Kulmov, of which 139,000 were gassed in the Reich Security Main Office gas vans. In the second period, because Kulmov was uh, reopened in uh, May 1944, basically to kill the remnants of the Jews in the Wartegau. Now, the only remnants of the Jews in the Wartegau are in the Lodz Littmannstadt ghetto. So, uh, some of the members of Zonder Commander Komhoff are brought back, including Gustav Labs. Two gas fans are assigned, they use one of those gas fans, and the uh, bring Jews from the Litmanstadt ghetto to be killed. There is a fight at this time between Oswald Pohl, head of the administration office of the SS, and Greiser in the civil administration as to who will control the Litmanstadt ghetto. Pohl wins that battle, so they decide Komov's no longer needed. They transfer the rest of the remnants of the Litmanstadt ghetto in August, from August 44 to Auschwitz, because probably because Komov is too slow. The method is too slow. By my estimates, and I still work on this, the total number uh, killed by Einsatzgruppe A to D in the Soviet Union is somewhere between 150 and 200,000. Lublin approximately 3,000. We know 
pretty clearly the number from Semlin in Belgrade, 5,000, and Mauthausen was not very much. Uh, 43 and 44, as the Einsatzgruppe start to wind down, the gas vans are reassigned. We know, for example, two gas vans from Einsatzgruppe D are assigned to Einsatzgruppe E in Zagreb, in Croatia. Uh, I still research this. In any case, by my estimate, somewhere between 305 to 355,000 people were killed in the RAG security main office gas vans. Okay, war crimes trials. The first set of war, uh, the first war crime trial related to those who designed, built, and designed the killing methodology. Uh, Friedrich Pradel and Harry Weintritt were tri uh, tracked down by the prosecutor's office in Hanover. It was identified that Ralph was in Chile. They tried to get him extradited from Chile with no success. And Dr. August Becker, who'd been the rover and inspector of gas vans, he was also, he, it was known where he lived, but he was old and frail. There was a trial held in Hanover. It ended up only being Pradel and Weintritt. Uh, the trial itself is, is quite interesting. It provides fantastic material to allow us to write the history of the gas vans, but in terms of a trial, it's uh, somewhat misleading. Pradel and Weintritt are, are accused of 3,832 murders of the 300 to 350,000. The prosecutor concentrates on specific cases, which is fair enough. Big problem, Kolmov is not mentioned. Why is Kolmov not mentioned? Because the bond trial has been going on for Kolmov and they've come up with a pretty specific number, which is around 140,000 victims. Now, given sentences were handed down in West Germany for war crimes trials based on number of victims, it's not surprising that the defense wanted to keep Kolmov out of the trial. So if you look at this trial, Kolmov is not mentioned once. A lesson there for historians, don't write histories of trial judgments. These are not historical fact. Uh, there was another trial of Dr. Widman. He'd already been tried in Dusseldorf in the early 60s, in that case for uh, poisoned ammunition experiments undertaken in Sachsenhausen. He was also put on trial in Stuttgart. Supposedly, uh, the trial would also encompass Becker. Becker wasn't fit. He didn't stand trial. Widman went on trial. He was accused of, of, in terms of the experiments uh, that I described earlier in Minsk and Mogilev, of killing five patients at Mogilev and 25 patients at Minsk. He was also accused of conspiracy to murder in terms of developing the gas fans and conspiracy to murder in terms of aiding the KDF in terms of the adult mercy killing program. Uh, he was found guilty, given six years and six months at Stuttgart. He was released immediately based on time served for the first trial in Dusseldorf and pre-trial detention. Interestingly enough, he was told to pay 1,000 Deutschmarks to a disabled charity of his choice, justice. Gas van drivers. Uh, I've identified there's probably somewhere between 30 to 40 RAG security main office gas van drivers. In terms of trials, I also already mentioned Labs. He was put on trial with other members of Sonderkommando Kulmhoff uh, in Bonn. He was found guilty of killing at least 45,000 people in Kulmhoff between 41 and 43, and the full 7,100 in the second period in summer of 44. He got one of the harshest sentences of any uh, person put on trial for war crimes trials in West Germany. He got 15 years of hard labor, later reduced to 30. In actual fact, we know from my reconciliation, Labs was personally responsible for 70,000, because there were two gas vans in Kumov, driven almost exclusively by uh, Gustav Labs, and the other driver was Herring. So Labs was responsible for 77,000 victims in his in the gas vans he drove alone, which is more than 20% of the total killed in gas vans. The other four trials are very interesting. These are all trials of gas van drivers from the Einsatzgruppe. 
What do you notice? Big black letters. Punishment was waived. Acquitted. 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 There is no memorial to the victims, a central memorial anyway, to the victims of the gas vans. The Reich Security Main Office gas vans, as I mentioned earlier, were responsible for between 300 and 350,000 victims, killed in a most, maybe the most horrific way possible. As you've seen from the lecture, the idea for the gas vans come from neighbor, Berlin. The build, of the gas vans is Reich Security Main Offices in Berlin, in Prince Albrecht's Russia, now Niederkirchenstrasse. The gas van drivers are ordered to report to AMP2, sorry, Reich Security Main Office headquarters in Berlin. They drive out from Prince Albrechtstrasse with their gas van east. The Kastenaufbau is built by Gaubschat in Berlin. The methodology for applying and using the gas vans is developed by the KTI, the Criminal Technische Institute in Reich Criminal Police Amt Headquarters in Verdeschermacht. They also do experiments there. And in Sachsenhausen, they do two to three experiments on people. There is nothing in Berlin apart from a small board at Sachsenhausen that would ever tell you the gas vans were developed right in the center of Berlin. Built there, assigned there, there is nothing. Conclusions. The Nazis did not develop the gas fan or build the gas fan. It wasn't their idea. It already existed. The gas fans in, in their usage by the Nazis came out of mercy killing of the mentally and physically disabled. There's a direct, many direct connections there. As I mentioned a few times already, the gas vans are not designed or built as mass killing methods. It's no surprising only between 300 and 350,000 people were killed in the gas vans. It's a big number, but in terms of the number of people the Nazis killed, it's a very small number. They were not suitable for use in Russia, or Soviet Union, I should say. few other points. People say, or some people say, including historians, everything is known about the Holocaust and the main features of the Holocaust. We don't need to research it. I would argue, and I've argued this a few times now, that is not correct. And hopefully my lecture shows that. Uh, the gas fans were horrific for the victim. This is a horrific way to die. Three other points. One, uh, this is the second of three lectures. There is a third one which uh, deals with uh, the interaction between gas vans and the origins of uh, Nazi killing methods in relation to Auschwitz, in relation to the action Reinhardt camps and other usage of poison gas. Secondly, haven't worked on this for 12 years. It's about time I produced the book, so next year the book will be published. <laughs> And thirdly, uh, yeah, I mean, we also think this is deserving of an exhibition. We've been talking to various people, including the Memorial for Murdered Jews, about potentially doing an exhibition on the gas vans in 25 or 26. One of the things you probably notice about the gas vans is they, they are used in actually many European countries. They're used in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Latvia, probably Lithuania, Serbia, Croatia, Poland, Austria. So there's a very much a pan-European basis to, to their usage. And finally, and I'm over time, sorry for that. Thank you very much for your time and patience. I thank you. As the uh, Nazi regime began to collapse, in terms of what happened to the gas vans, most were returned to the uh, truck park for the SS in uh, Oranienburg, Sachsenhausen. For example, the two Kumhoff gas vans were returned there. 
Others, we don't know what happened to them. Others were left. All that happened is probably the, uh, the structure of the gas fan was disconnected and removed, and then they just looked like ordinary trucks. So it's probably not surprising that no gas fan was ever discovered, because if you, if you take away the... It's just a cast and outbow base structure like any of the others. If you don't have the Schlauch mechanism, you know, it, it will not uh, be able to identify it as a gas fan. We know from the testimony of... Uh the last Jewish prisoners uh, that some Schutzpolizei member were sent to Warsaw and some of them were killed during the uprising. One, Others, one, of, the, one of the uh, Kumhof crew member, one of the car drivers uh, was sentenced to death in yes. post-war Poland. He was operated in Kumhof in second period. Yes, yep. so, Gilov. Huh? Gilov, Hermann Gilov. Uh, one of two members, three members of the commando sentenced to death in Poland. First, second in command, uh, Walter Piller was hanged. Yeah. Uh, Gilov was hanged, but the third man, Bruno Israel, was uh, extradited to NRD and in the 50s. So yeah, yeah. He escaped from that. I mean, nothing would surprise me now. I mean, uh, you know, the thing with the gas fans is you have, to, you have to do the research empirically. So that's why I've been at it for 12 years. I look at every testimony, every word. Because that's the only way, really, to get to the bottom of what's going on, because there's no documents, or very few. So, but in, nothing surprises me now, you know. Uh, like, I put up that slide on the NKVD, building a gas van in but, you know, Batovo. Another connection with the testimony, because I, I was working on the book uh, on the escapers from, from Kulmkov, and one of them, uh, Mortka Żurawski, uh, testified in uh, Greiser's process, in 46, and he testified that uh, when his able brother, uh, they were brought to one of the um, camps for lab labor camps for Jews near mm -hmm. the Poznan, uh, they came to the Gusze, Dusze Gubka, so the, the gas one in, uh, in jargon of, of, of Soviets, and the goes, goes next. So, uh, so maybe in 40, 41, it was in 41, that the name Dusze Gubka was known in, in Poland. Sure, I'm sure. So it's maybe before some yeah. informations from Soviet Union of came course. to Poland about this box sure. used by NKVD. So it's the point is, I mean, look, you know, I, 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 as I've been talking about in the first lecture and the second one, I mean, it's not a, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to design and build a gas van. I mean, it's already been done in the 19th century. It's not, a, it's not a, a particularly difficult technology. What's, what is difficult you know, on vehicles at the time is to build something that will withstand the roads of the Soviet Union. <laughs> That's the real problem. But it's, the technology itself is pretty simple. So, you know, doing the research, I've sort of has opened my eyes a bit, and, you know, I'm probably much more accepting of, of some of the evidence than maybe I would have pr uh, been, you know, before doing the research. I would like to ask a question uh, about the beginnings uh, in Posen. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know that the very first gassing uh, at the fore in the gas chamber um, was done by cyanide. And you said uh, that this was discarded by obvious reasons. Ah, so I would yeah, like okay. to ask you about the obvious reasons about it and why then um, carbon monoxide in bottles was chosen even for the first gas vans, um, um, for this first phase. Um, my, I would say, uh, uh, knowledge before used to be that actually exhaust um, um, fume killings were sort of invented by Wittmann and Neber uh, in Magilyov. Uh, now, um, you said it was there before. Correct. Uh, and I would like to ask you about this, these different techniques being applied in Posen um, until actually spring 1941. Okay. During 1922, Nevada becomes the first US state to allow uh, gas to be used for capital punishment. 1924, Ji Jong, is the f a Chinese immigrant, is killed uh, in Nevada using hydrogen cyanide. At different stages, uh, a, you know, a number of U.S. states ad adopted poison gas before the f f uh, Second World War, and basically they looked at using hydrogen cyanide, 
sorry, they looked at using Zyklon B. Problem with Zyklon B is Zyklon B, uh, which is, was the most widely used uh, product for disinfestation uh, before the Second World War. It was used all over the world, in Britain, Australia, America. The problem with it is it was designed for a specific purpose for disinfestation. It was not designed to kill people. And with dis disinfestation, again, it comes back to I talked to at the beginning about the four to five objectives of designing a killing methodology. In the case of Zyklon B, you don't want people to be killed applying Zyklon B to kill rats in warehouses. So what do you do? Hydrogen cyanide, like carbon monoxide, doesn't have much of a smell, if any. It's very difficult to detect. And if you can't detect it, you're going to die if you're exposed to it. So the designers of the product in the early 20s decide to put in a uh, something that would allow the user to become aware that they'd been exposed to hydrogen cyanide. And the way they did that was irritants. Irritants for their eyes, irritants for the throat. So uh, that's point one. Point two, Zyklon B was associated with killing rats. So the obvious reasons are, given the Adult Mercy Killing Program and before that the children's uh, program in Nazi Germany was uh, secret, and it was secret for a reason, because the authorities were worried that the German public would not be too happy about their relatives or friends being killed. Even worse, there was thoughts about trying to make uh, mercy killing legal. Now, the whole uh, thought process behind mercy killing and the use of gas would completely be undermined if it was found out that the uh, mentally and physically disabled relatives and friends were being killed with Zyklon B, which was used for killing rats. That is why uh, it was discounted pretty soon. The SS head of, you know, different SS uh, medical uh, departments in the SS. And it comes back to the KDF knew nothing about killing. And uh, at the beginning, guys like Gravitz, who again were pretty barbaric uh, guys, they were suggesting Zyklon B. Now, it was pointed out that if, if the killing program becomes public, there's a big problem if people discover that Zyklon B, which is used for killing rats and hydrogen cyanide, is being used in the States for killing condemned prisoners, being used to kill innocent, uh, mentally and physically disabled. So they then turned to some proper experts. For example, Ferdinand Flurry, who is uh, probably the most highly renowned toxicologi toxicologist in Germany. He's professor at Würzburg. He worked with Professor Haber during the First World War in terms of developing chemical weapons. And Flurry, amongst other toxicologists, is, an asked, is asked, and he said, the only gas you should use is carbon monoxide and use it pure. Because in that case, it could well be argued that there are limited symptoms in terms of what the victims suffer. So therefore, it could be argued if you ever tried to make mercy killing legal, that this was a humane method. That is the thought process they went through. In terms of, you know, Vidman and the use of exhaust gas, there is strong evidence that even though Zonderkommando Langer, which was killing the uh, mentally and physically disabled of the Vartiga, were using mostly carbon monoxide pure in gas canisters, we do know because the gas canisters were delivered from Berlin, centrally organized probably by Becker, he was the one who delivered them to Grafenek, Hadamar, etc., the fixed killing centers in Germany. It also seems he delivered a batch on a periodic basis to Langer. Now, we've also got uh, testimony that sometimes they weren't delivered or they were late. And we've also got uh, evidence, therefore, from the testimonies that they resorted to exhaust gas, which is an obvious thing to do. You know, what's the difference between dying from carbon monoxide pure and Exhaust gas, actually massive. In carbon monoxide, it's got no smell. You know, you're going to suffer some symptoms. That beautiful uh, health picture I put up before the description of the reality of the gas fans. If you use pure carbon monoxide, 
The symptoms can be less, can be few. You could maybe say it was humane. You apply exhaust gas, the problem with exhaust gas, it's full of irritants. You can smell it, you can taste it. Psychologically, if you're in a gas van and suddenly exhaust gas is poured into this space which is maybe dark, full of people, you know you're going to die, yeah? because you can taste and smell it. If it's pure carbon monoxide, you can't. So therefore, there is you know, a big difference between using exhaust gas and using pure carbon monoxide. But uh, the testimonies do say at some points, Langer, before the Rag Security Main Office gas lines were delivered, did use exhaust gas. There is a famous story, yeah? April, May, 41, neighbor goes to Heydrich, says, I've had this brilliant idea. Gas fans to kill the mentally and physically disabled of the Soviet Union. And then you've got the famous story, ah, I fell asleep in my garage, drunk, left the car running, I almost died. That's when I came up with the bright idea of using exhaust gas. I mean, that's just a typical neighbor, you know, look at me, aren't I great, impress my bosses. That story is almost certainly not true because we know already from the testimonies that Langer probably at some point used exhaust gas. There are even uh, some different uh, description of the, of the bodies of the victims. In first period, in first month, we have a testimony, uh, luckily we have testimony of uh, eyewitness, so Schlama Wiener, and he describes the victims' uh, bodies uh, looked normally as they fell asleep. But in the second period, when you read the testimony of Simon Srebnik, they look terribly, the bodies look terribly, as scratched as, as you described. So the pure mono carbon monoxide wa wasn't as destructive as, yeah, as a second. Uh, did you um, find during your, uh, during your research some evidences of using another types of uh, um, substances used added to the, um, to the gas? Very good question. Uh, because I've analyzed some bills from the Sonderkonto 12,300. 12, yep. So the special, conto, special account uh, used uh, by Sonderkommando and uh, headquarters of, of, of uh, German administration of the Lodge Ghetto. And the Sonderkommando sometimes ordered um, a specific uh, called uh, Suprex. Mm -hmm. It's a type of um, uh, substan disinfection substance. So maybe it was some, there were some tests of addition to the gas. It's a good point. So to answer your so question, uh, Einsat uh, Zonder Commando 4B uh, in the Soviet Union were assigned, they were, uh, they were the only ones, they were assigned a uh, Series 2 gas van with no driver from Berlin. So nobody had been trained on the use of the gas van. Okay. They use their gas van and gas while the gas van is uh, driving. Point one. Point two, they're experimenting themselves because they have no assigned driver. Two, they add Zyklon B to the exhaust gas to quicken the process. So yes. Again, quite well possible because we know from Zon uh, Zonic Command of 4B, that's what they did. Okay, so um, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, I think uh, some of you will um, uh, agree with me that it was a really, really interesting presentation. I thank you very much for coming. No and thank you very much for doing it. And we are looking forward to the third. Thank you part. very much. Yeah. Uh, you have to tell us what it's about in one sentence. Oh, one okay. sentence. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the origins and how the Nazis came to use the other gases and killing methods in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the Action Reinhardt camps, and elsewhere, and the interactions again with, you know, the gas fans, the uh, sequence of events we have described today from Minsk, Mogilev, etc., onwards, etc., etc. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. so to finish it off, to close the circle, yes. something to look forward to. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Janka, uh, for coming from the epicenter yeah, of it thank all, you, from Kulmhof, Hermno. Uh,
Um, also, if you're interested uh, afterwards or you're coming back another time, uh, you can read more about the Judenlager Zemlin and, uh, and, and Belgrade on the fami family de Mayo in the room of families. And you can also read about Mali Trostnitz and Majdanek and some of the other places that Kelno, some of the other places you mentioned uh, in your speech. Also, a great thank you for all of you who made this possible. Uh, first of all, the Association D4, then Grisha for filming, Uwe Seemann for the technical side of it, and Elena Schetz and uh, Bettina Brederek for uh, organizing everything tonight. And thanks very much for your patience, and uh, thank you very much all for coming.